Today is the uh, Feast of the Circumcision. Here again in Boise. One second. Yeah, that's good. And the epistle for this night, for the same, from January the 1st, Feast of the Circumcision of the Lord, and the Octave Day of Nativity, is taken from St. Paul's end of the Titus, chapter 2. Dearly beloved, the grace of God our Savior hath appeared to all men, instructing us that denying ungodliness and worldly desires, we should live soberly and justly and godly in this world, looking for the blessed hope and coming of the glory of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and might cleanse to himself a people acceptable and pursuer of good works. These saints speak and exhort in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the gospel is taken that in exam, saying that according to St. Luke chapter 2. At that time, after eight days were accomplished, that the child should be circumcised, his name was called Jesus, which was called by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So in other words, today's holy gospel. Amen. Well then, Father, Son, and Ghost, Amen. So a few considerations on that, uh, as we mentioned in an earlier sermon today, one of the points that the what makes us different from our Lord uh, of a human being, when God the Son became man, that Jesus Christ is, is in flesh, God is in flesh, and that, uh, that God is always God, God is everywhere, but in the Blessed Sacrament there is a great miracle, and the miracle is not so much that God is there, because God is easily in any place and every place, but that the humanity of Jesus Christ is there. That the whole of his mind, the whole of his heart, the whole of his passions, the whole of his flesh is in that little host. And that the miracle of the Incarnation is the miracle not of God being God and God being present, but God being in flesh. And that when the, when, when the Pentecost happens and the, Jesus Christ finishes his physical work upon the earth himself, he sent his apostles to carry his own body, to carry his divinity and human flesh to the ends of the earth. And he gave an instruction. And he gave the instruction on Pentecost Sunday when he said, Go in therefore, teach all nations, and teach the gospel to every creature. And so teach all nations and teach every creature about my coming. And carry me to the ends of the earth. Carry me to the very ends of the earth. And the sacred scripture says, Blessed are the feet of the carriers of the gospel of peace. The gospel is God's word. And that is always divine and wonderful. And in, but what makes the gospel amazing is that human feet can carry it. And that, and that a human heart can live according to it. And that human flesh can have God inside of it. When in the majority of flesh, all flesh is conceived with original sin, because of Adam's sin, in most flesh rejects God and doesn't want God inside of the flesh. The great battle of Christianity, the battle of the Catholic Church, is to carry the divine God into human flesh. And when we look at the world around us, we find 7 billion people on the earth, and they don't want God. They don't want God inside of them. They don't want God anywhere in their being. They reject Him. But we have to carry Him into human flesh. And so therefore, but consider that 2,000 years ago, and consider 4,000 years ago. About close 3,600 years ago, uh, 3,500 years ago, God said to, 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 the, to, the, to, to, uh, to the Jews that he was going to give them the Holy Land. And they came out of Egypt in the time of Moses. And then Moses wanted to see what that land looked like that was going to be given to them, and he sent the 12 spies, one spy from every one of the 12 tribes. These 12 spies were replaced by the 12 apostles. But the great difference is Moses sent 12 spies and the promise of God was given to receive a land about the size of Connecticut. And Jesus Christ sent 12 spies, 12 apostles. And they said, we don't want a land the size of Connecticut. We want the entire earth is going to be under the dominion of God and God ruling in human flesh. He wants the gospel preached in every single nation. 
He wants there to be the kings of every nation to bow down before him. And he told the apostles, go to every nation. And he told the 12 spies, Moses told the 12 spies, go to a land that has been promised to us. Now the 12 spies went to the land that was promised. And 10 of the spies, when they went into that land, each of them representing the 10 tribes, when these 10 spies went into that land, what did they see? They saw huge walled cities. They saw people more numerous than ants. And they saw great weapons. And they saw really mean people. And they saw a land that could not be conquered by 600,000 men that they crossed the Red Sea. And so they said, this is, this is impossible. God led us out of Egypt only that we can die in this land. We cannot conquer that land. And then two spies walked into that land, and that was Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua looked into that land, and he said, "This is look at this land. It's got beautiful buildings. We can move into them. It's got wonderful, uh, incredible fruits, incredible uh, land for growing things. It's a most beautiful land. And they all 12 walked in the same land. All 12 had human eyes. All 12 saw the world around them. But ten saw one thing, obstacles. Ten saw people that weren't going to accept the Jews to come and take over that land. When God says, this is your land, and I'm going to give you all this land, and I'm going to remove everyone that's in that land from it, and it will be 100% your land, who can stop the word of God? No one. But these ten spies didn't know that. They thought there's more of them than there are of us, and we can't defeat them. It's impossible that the word of God be fulfilled in us. Now remember these spies had just crossed the Red Sea and they just watched the entire army of the Egyptians get wiped out in one minute. And these spies who just saw that great miracle said, how are we going to conquer these guys? How are we going to win here? And so God was angry with them. And that is why God said, you will wander through this desert of Arabia for 40 years. And not one of those spies, nor their, and they're representatives of their tribe. So 600,000 men, they came back and gave the report. And when the people heard the report, 598,000 men, they were very disturbed at the report. And they were upset. Joshua and Caleb said, God said he's going to give us a land. He'll take care of the city of Jericho and its high walls. He'll take care of all these uh, armies that we need to meet. They'll all be wiped out. Everyone's going to be, because God said it's ours. He saw that it's ours. This is our land. And the ten did not believe that it was our land, but the others did. And so they was very, he was very, very uh, upset. God was very upset with the Jewish people. I just brought you through the land of Eden, the Red Sea. I just wiped out the Egyptian army of Pharaoh. And now you're worried about a few of these wicked souls that live in the land of Israel that I'm going to give to you. And so... The, the, he therefore made them wander 40 years of the desert until all those over the year of, uh, age of 20, everyone was dead. And only Joshua and Caleb entered the promised land. Come forward again to the time of Christ. And he has 12 spies. Matthias taking the place of Judas. And Jesus Christ sends these 12 spies. And he says, I want you to go and see every land in which I am going to rule. You will set foot in every continent. And these 12 apostles set foot in every continent, including the United States, North America, including South America. And all the world, they set foot on every continent. And they all sat together. And imagine those 12 spies sitting together after Pentecost. And they took a map of the world. And they said, this world has been given to us by God. And these were the greatest soldiers and generals that have ever led armies in the history of the world. Remember that these 12 apostles, they are bishops of the church. They are captains and generals in the army of God. They are the pillars of our faith. And when these pillars stood, they said, we are going to conquer the whole world. And they looked at the map and said, this whole world is for Jesus Christ. This whole world is going to have his cross planted in it. Every kingdom is going to be subdued by the knowledge and love of God. Now, when they were meeting, there were a total of 120 Catholics in the world. There were only a few Catholics when they had their meeting. And they were there, and there were only a few priests, and only a few bishops. And they only lived in one place in the land of Israel. 
But they divided the entire world up amongst them, and not one of them doubted. When Moses chose twelve good men, these twelve men went, and ten of them didn't believe. And God punished the whole Jewish people because of those ten. Only Joshua and Caleb. And when the twelve gave the report, the Jewish people believed the ten rather than the, the, the two. So that our Bishop Sheen points out, they believed the majority report, but they didn't believe the minority report. And the minority report was the one that was right and the one that was true. Because what did Joshua and Caleb recognize? God said, God said, this is our land. That's the same God that said the sun is going to be in the sky, 93 million miles from the earth. The same God said that the mountains exist and the valleys, and that's why they exist. So therefore, if the God that said sun and there is sun, and God that said mountain and there is mountain, if that same God says this is our land, it's our land. Now we must understand we are now in one of the times of God said, we are now in the time of the ending of the fifth age of the church, which is the age of the great decline and great apostasy, and the transition to the sixth age of the church, which is the age of a brief and great and glorious victory all over the world, followed by a collapse and the ending of times and the Antichrist. But we are not yet at that time. We are one of the times of God said. Remember when Mattathias stood up, and his five sons with him. Israel was in a terrible, terrible state. But one of his sons was Judas. And Judas was so filled with the power of God in his heart, so filled with the love of God in his heart, and he was priest and he was warrior. He was priest and soldier. And he was so powerful a soldier that he was called the Hammer or the Maccabee, and two books of the Bible are named after him, the Book of the Maccabees. His brothers are called hammers because he was a hammer and they imitated him. He was the third of the five sons. And he was the one that would lead them in battle and, and, and brought about the great glory of Israel for a brief period before the coming of, of our Lord Jesus Christ the first time. We are now in that time of the New Testament where there's going to be the great glory of Mary that has been prophesied. What should be our spirit when we enter into this time? Because we're going to be like those ten spies or the twelve spies that only Joshua believed. And we consider this great faith of Joshua. He was such a great warrior that one time when he was in battle and his enemies were not sufficiently destroyed, he wanted to destroy them in the name of God and wipe them out completely that this land might be a holy land. And therefore he called to heaven and he said, O ye son, do not proceed further. He commanded the sun to stop in the sky, and the sun truly stopped so that Joshua could wipe out his enemies. It was a long night in America. It was a long night in China. And it was a long day in the Mideast and, and in Europe because Joshua needed light to fight his enemies, and the sun stopped because the sun obeyed Joshua. Because Joshua's faith in Yeshua Yeshua is the same name of Jesus. Yeshua is Jesus, the same name. And he had the heart of Jesus inside of himself. And remember that it's a heart of a warrior. Now we come to the New Testament. The twelve apostles have a greater heart than Joshua had. They've got a greater conviction than he had. Yes, they had followed. Remember, these twelve men did run away as cowards when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane. But they will never be cowards again. And these twelve men had great, great strength in them. They had God in their flesh. The fathers tell us that they were confirmed in grace. They had so much God inside of them that they were not capable of committing a mortal sin ever again in their lives, and they never did. They would make some human mistakes, such as St. Peter, when he, when he began to, to uh, placate the Judaizers. And St. Paul had to correct him. A human mistake, but no sin. And he corrected that mistake as soon as St. Paul pointed out that it was a mistake. Because St. Peter was a warrior who would never fall back again. Now consider the meeting of the twelve apostles when they had lots. And they sat with a map of the world. Said, God said, Jesus Christ said only a few months ago. Preach the gospel to every creature. And, and bring the gospel to every kingdom. 
to the entire world. Therefore, we will divide the world into 12 parts. Now, why was it divided into 12 parts? Because there were only 12 apostles. And they divided the world into 12 parts. And they cast lots as to which one would go to what part. And then they went alone into those 12 parts. And they didn't have cell phones. And they didn't have internet. They didn't have means to communicate with the others. But each apostle knew, I am going alone into the land of Israel. I'm going alone into the land of Northern Europe. Alone into Africa. Alone into India. Alone throughout the, way, the, the entirety of Asia. Alone in the United States and South America. I am going alone. And I am going to bring this world under subjection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to plant the cross there. And flesh shall receive the word of God. And flesh shall praise God. And God shall be inside of human flesh. And it is the will of God that my flesh, the flesh of the priest, carry God to the ends of the earth. And the flesh of the faithful carry God to the ends of the earth. That's what we're supposed to do with our feet. That's what we're supposed to do with our bodies. Carry, the, carry Christ to the ends of the earth. And this is a time when we begin to do that work again. We must carry Christ to the very ends of the earth, knowing that he will reign, that he will be conquering the whole world. These twelve apostles had no doubt in them, including the great doubting Thomas. He traveled further than the others. No doubt was found in them. No shake, They could never be shaken again. These apostles could never teach heresy. These apostles could never turn against God. And they carried the faith to the ends of the earth. And then they taught their priests that they were ordained, and the bishops that they were ordained, and the faithful that they would baptize. You must carry this gospel to the ends of the earth. And they recognized the prophecy of God cannot be stopped. Now the first prophecy was the faith would spread to the ends of the earth. And when it had spread to every continent, then there would come a great apostasy. And that happened 500 years ago. But then at the end of the great apostasy, there will be a renewal. And that's what's going to come next. We're now in the time of that renewal. And then there will be a victory of Mary. And every nation shall kneel before God. And we see the signs of it right now. Open your eyes and see. Putin, head of Russia, communist. What is he doing? He is helping to build, using millions and millions of rupees, millions and millions of dollars, to do what? To build the largest basilica in the world dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary, with more mosaics in it than any other church has ever been built. And he went there to put the last piece of mosaic in its place as the head of Russia. And these are supposed to be the enemies of God. Donald Trump, the president, non-Catholic, with his third wife, not living exactly as he should live. What is he doing? He is consecrating. He says that, that December 29th is going to be the 850th anniversary of the death of St. Thomas Beckett, and that there is, and that this, this he, is, he is making a national holiday that St. Thomas Beckett stood up against the oppression of the church by the state. And he stood at the intersection between the church and the state, he says in his document, and, his, and, he, and he stood to prevent the oppression of the church by the state. And he said, I will gladly die, says St. Thomas Beckett, for the name of Jesus and for his holy church. The defense of his holy church. And so he did gladly die in holy robes. And so said Donald Trump. And now is going to come a time again where there must be a standing up against the oppression of the church by the state. And what's going to happen next? is the victory of Mary. Those twelve apostles, when they went out to the ends of the earth, they went with power in their minds, power in their hearts, power in their conditions. One simple example was when St. Thomas arrived in India, and he arrived in the city of Madras, and they saw 40 Tamilians with, uh, to, uh, to taking a huge log from the, tr from the ocean and trying to pull it in. A huge tree that was, uh, there aren't very many trees there, trying to pull that log in. He said, step aside. And he himself picked it up. He was a stonemason. He was a construction man himself. He picked up that log by himself, brought it in. And then imagine what they must have thought when Thomas said to them, this is my log. Any of you guys got a problem with that? They said, we don't have a problem at all. You pick up that big, huge log, you bring it in, it's your log. And then he built a church out of that log. He cut it, and they watched him cut. And he cut, and he cut, and he cut, and he built the church, and the wood never ran out. And then he said, you're going to join this church. And they did. Imagine what was in the character of such a man. 
He was a priest. He was a bishop. He was an apostle. He had a great heart. And he carried that log in. And he converted that people to, to God. And then God also told Thomas, You have come to India, and there will create, Christ will remain in this land till the end of the world. And so it has been. For the entire 2,000 years, there have always been Catholics there. And there shall be Catholics until the ending of the world. Christ went to conquer the whole world, and he will conquer it. And now is the time when the conquering is going to come to its fruition. Then afterwards, another collapse. But remember, the word of God is truth. And what is so wonderful about the word of God is that he made our human flesh able to hold that word, able to carry that word, able to make that word to be fulfilled in our actions, in our hearts, in our minds, in our words, in our lives. And hence, as it said on the day of the circumcision, the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 2. And after eight days were accomplished, the child was circumcised by the wonderful St. Joseph, quiet St. Joseph. And he received the name of Jesus given to him by St. Joseph, the protector of the church, which was given to him before he was conceived by the angel. And remember, as our lives as Catholics, it is given to us what already was promised, already was prophesied. If we live by the law of God, we shall have a hundredfold of happiness here below. We're going to see God face to face in heaven. So we've got to remember that we have a, a, a victory in, in, our, in, in front of us. We have, we have Christ's victory in front of us, and we cannot be defeated by the words of the lies of the devil and by the, the, the false promises of the false prophets of the modern world. Let us follow the true prophet. He has said what's going to happen, and it will happen. All words he's spoken have come true, and they will continue to come true until the end of times. In any case, it was late. But God bless you all then. And, uh, and uh, confidence in carrying Christ in flesh. In his name of Jesus, which means Savior. And Joshua, the same word. You were the first man that carried that word. Who carried that name. He was a warrior. He fought his way to the Holy Land. He defeated and wiped out the enemies of God. And he had total confidence. And he always thought of war. That was what was in his heart. He was a warrior warrior. Remember when he came down the mountain with Moses. Moses was 40 days on the top of the mountain. And halfway down the mountain was Joshua waiting. And Moses came down and Joshua came with him. And they heard a loud roaring in the camp of the Jews. And Joshua said, it's a battle. Let's go and join them. Moses said, it's not a battle. It's a wicked party. <laughs> and then Joshua did what that day? He led the charge of killing 30,000 Jews. There was much blood shed in that day. And according to Jewish tradition, what God did is commanded Moses to do that day, Moses commanded Joshua to did Aaron to do it, melt down the golden calf, put it in the liquid, and take that liquid and put it inside of water and make everybody drink the golden calf. And they drank it. <coughs> Those that were displeasing to God and did not repent, there was a, a visibility of a, of a boils came on their skin. And they, and they were all slain. And then what did Moses say on that day? Who is on the Lord's side? Come over here. And when they came over there, who was the one that led them in battle? It was Joshua. And 30,000 were killed that day. Remember that Jesus Christ is a warrior. He is a warrior king. And he wants his, his faith to be carried to the ends of the earth. And it must be carried uh, by us to the very ends of the earth. That it must be conquered for Christ. Closing up this to all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.